Here we go again. This is As Simple As Possible A and P. Uh, chapter 12, Very General Structure of the Brain, Part 1. Uh, using the graffiti pages that are available to you online and were handed out in class, here goes the information. We'll start off with rostral and caudal. Uh, synonymous terms for anterior and posterior in reference to the brain. Of course, the brain sits atop the spinal cord. Now, the 12 pairs of cranial nerves are not actually part of the brain, but they are associated with it. Therefore, we're going to ask you to remember the 12 pairs of cranial nerves. And here is a series of ways you can do it. One way is to just go ahead and come up with some kind of a, a mnemonic, such as O-O-O-T-T-A-F-V-G-V-A-H, which doesn't mean anything, unless you turn it into a sentence like, our only opportunity to tell a few very good verses about hope or heaven. So by creating a sentence, a mnemonic, you can keep the first letters in order, but of course you have to know what each letter stands for. And so you got three O's right here and two T's and a couple of A's and a couple of V's. Uh, yeah, you're, you're going to have to make sure you know the information, not just the letter. Another way to remember the sequence is to do it backwards. So that was 1 to 12. Here's 12 to 1. Have GV fat 2. A silly way to remember the order and such. Of course, you do have to know the Roman numerals. So you have to be able to recognize 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 9, 10, 11, and 12 in Roman numerals. And one thing that some people do is they try to um, create an image on the head and chest that represents the location of these 12 pairs of cranial nerves. So here's a, a beginning of the thing. 12 is hypoglossal, 11 is the accessory, 10 is the vagus, 9 is glossopharyngeal, 8 is vestibular cochlear, 7 is the facial, 6 is the abducens, Five is the trigeminal, four is the trochlear, three is the ocular motor, two is the optic nerve, and one is the olfactory. So, 12 pairs of cranial nerves aren't difficult for me. 12 hypoglossal, 11 the accessory, 10 is the vagus, 9 glossopharyngeal, 8 vestibular cochlear, 7 is the facial, 6 the abducens, 5 trigeminal, trochlear is 4, 3 ocular motor, 2 the optic nerves, and the first is the olfactory. That's the kind of crap we learn in AMP. Wow. Anyway, any silly way that you can remember this stuff is important. So first you learn it's silly, then later on it becomes more uh, serious and stable. But you do need to know the 12 pairs of cranial nerves for the sake of the test. You also need to know which three are usually sensory, and that's one, the olfactory, sense of smell, two, the optic sight, of course, and then number eight, the vestibular cochlear, which happens to be for hearing, like that chainsaw you hear in the background there. Okay, perfectly timed. Okay, we need some general landmarks when it comes to the surface of the brain. So here are two fissures, two sulci, and two gyri that you really, really need to know. The two fissures are the longitudinal fissure and the transverse fissure. Now, this shows us that a sulcus is a shallow groove a gyrus is a raised ridge, and a fissure is a deep groove. And this puts a wrinkled pattern to the surface of the cerebrum. Cerebrum is said to have a convoluted surface, a wrinkled surface. This, of course, allows you to have more uh, cerebral cortex material in one space. The wrinkling allows you to put more cerebral cortex, more thinking space, so to speak, uh, inside this area right here. So the convolutions are for the sake of packing more cortex inside your brain area. And the fissures are the deeper grooves. The shallower grooves are called sulci. So there is a lateral sulcus on the side right here and then a central sulcus right there. So one longitudinal, one transverse fissure, but there's two lateral sulci and two central sulci, uh, one on each one of the cerebral hemispheres. Some book called the lateral sulcus a fissure because it is particularly deep. Uh, it's good to know that the longitudinal fissure separates the two cerebral hemispheres. The transverse fissure separates the occipital lobe of the cerebrum from the cerebellum. Uh, the lateral sulcus right here separates the frontal lobe from the temporal lobe and the central sulcus separates the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. 
again, general landmarks to keep us from getting too lost. We said there were two fissures, two Celsi and two gyri we wanted to know, and here are the two gyri that are the common landmarks. That is, here is the central sulcus, separating the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. Here is the pre-central gyrus, and here is the post-central gyrus. Now, of course, everything is uh, grossly simplified in this cartoon right here, so it's not that straight. But the pre-central gyrus and the post-central gyrus are like riverbanks next to this stream right here, and they have some very unique features, which we'll go over later on. Before we go much farther, let's go back over here and look at the big and obvious things. For example, the four main regions of the brain. It is cerebrum, cerebellum, brainstem, and diencephalon. But the diencephalon is not visible on the outside of the brain. So here's a schematic of the brain. Here's the cerebrum right here, which is the largest part of the brain. Uh, it looks sort of like a mushroom cap on top of everything else. The cerebrum is where your sense of awareness is, uh, your memory. Uh, most of you, the personality is right here. Uh, yes. Right here's your diencephalon. The diencephalon, it literally means two in the head, and there's actually three things right here to look at. We'll talk about the hypothalamus, the thalamus, and the epithalamus. Below that is the brain stem, which does look like a stem, and it is also made up of three parts and that would be the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. Back here is the cerebellum, and the cerebellum is pretty much connected to the back of the pons. So the pons, the word pons means bridge, and it very much is a bridge between the upper part of the nervous system and the spinal cord and medulla and lower part and the cerebellum in the back. All right, back over here. A reminder that you've got a frontal lobe, a parietal lobe, a temporal lobe, an occipital lobe, and down here you have something sort of hanging down. It's got a little stalk. That stalk is called an infundibulum, and the thing hanging down right here is called the pituitary gland. That's the old name for it. The new name is the hypophysis. More about that later. Uh, looking at a cutaway section of the brain right here. Okay, let's see what we can identify. Uh, here is the cerebral cortex to the outside, and notice in our incredibly oversimplified picture, it kind of looks like a three and an E facing each other. The cerebral cortex dips in dramatically right here where the lateral sulcus is located. And this little extra fold of cerebral cortex so deep inside the cerebrum is called the insula. The word insula, like in the word insulate, means separate. And so it's separated from the surface. You can't see it unless you could somehow open up the lateral sulci and look deep inside. At the top right here is the longitudinal fissure separating the two cerebral hemispheres. And as a bridge between the two cerebral hemispheres is the corpus callosum. Something else stylized simple right here. These islands of gray matter can be called the basal nuclei in very general terms. And remember that gray matter inside the brain represents where neuron cell bodies are located. And so here we have an island, a cluster of neuron cell bodies. Up here, we have a layer of neuron cell bodies. And all the rest of this material in between is white matter. It's basically axons, myelinated and unmyelinated, sending signals back and forth between all these other neuron cell bodies. Looking at the big and the obvious again, down here, have another cutaway view of the brain. Uh, here is the cerebrum. Here's the cerebellum. Here is the spinal cord. There's the medulla. There's the pons. It looks like a little round belly. There's the midbrain. And then above that, this thing right here that looks like a bird's head with a beak and a berry in the beak. This thing right here is the diencephalon. This part is the thalamus. This is the hypothalamus. Here's the infundibulum, and below that, the pituitary gland. So if you're using your imagination, it kind of sort of looks like a bird with a berry and a beak. There's the neck, there's the body, and there's the bottom of the thing. Mm -hmm. uh, since we're in the neighborhood, let's keep on going. Over here, a dural sinus. It turns out that the dura mater wraps around the outside of the brain and the spinal cord. 
and at the very top of the brain, sort of jumping across the longitudinal fissure, you have a space that's created by the uh, dura mater. Now, that space right there dips down, goes to the corpus callosum, makes another space, and then goes back up again. So there's a triangle here, and there's even a triangle down here where it bumps into the corpus callosum. Well, the dura mater, the outermost layer of the meninges, actually has two layers around it in the brain. The outermost layer is called the periosteal layer because it's up against the bone, the bone of the skull. The next layer below that, which is closer to the brain itself, is called the meningeal layer. And right here at the um, longitudinal fissure, where it kind of jumps the, the gourd right there, uh, it splits and it creates this triangular space right here. And we mentioned it goes down into the longitudinal fissure, splits again and creates another little space down there. Well, this little space right here is filled with blood and so is this, and they act like veins. Now, they're more specifically called the superior sagittal sinus and the inferior sagittal sinus. And they do represent uh, venous blood uh, being drawn away from the brain and heading towards the back of the brain, the caudal region, where we'll then join up with some other uh, large sinuses. So the dural sinus is this one that's found at the top right here and is a space created by the dura mater. Where the dura mater goes down into the longitudinal fissure and also back here in the transverse fissure and in a few more spots, these things are called dural folds. And these are almost like wedgies going down in these spaces right here and they're anchoring the brain in those regions. Since we're going just through the page right here, let's step on over here and pick up some things like TBI. Uh, traumatic brain injury. Uh, here's two examples, concussion and contusion. The big deal difference between a concussion and contusion in the simplest form is, a concussion is like a shock wave going through the soft material of your brain. And in every shock wave, there is a front of compression and right behind it is an area of rarefaction. In the front of compression, things are squeezed together, and in the area of rarefaction, things are spread apart. Well, it's that spreading apart that sometimes rips apart blood vessels and other things inside the brain as the shockwave goes through. If tissues are torn, it's commonly called a contusion, because tissues were torn. If it was just a shockwave, that's called a concussion. In general, a concussion is temporary and not as serious as a contusion because in a contusion, tissues are torn and that represents real damage. Well, some of the damage that may be done is breaking blood vessels. And if you break a blood vessel, it's going to bleed. And so that's called hemorrhaging. So you could have a hemorrhaging of a blood vessel. Now, if the blood accumulates in some area, uh, it's called a hematoma. And sometimes when there's injuries to the head, hematomas form, and here are two areas where they form commonly, in the epidural space on the outside of the dura mater, uh, between the dura mater and the skull, or just below the dura mater in the subdural space, which is between the dura mater and the arachnoid. So epidural and subdural hematomas are common, and each one has a slightly different effect on the individual. One of the most significant uh, concerns, however, is the accumulated blood represents a pressure point that's pushing down upon nervous tissue. When nervous tissue is uh, put under pressure, very often it stops functioning, uh, sort of like your arm going to sleep if you pinch the nerve in your armpit. Well, Again, a epidural or a subdural hematoma is like a finger pushing down on the brain and again can do a wide variety of strange things. Here's some more strange things. Meningitis and hydrocephalus. In hydrocephalus, you have an accumulation of fluid in and around the brain. The problem again becomes pressure. Pressure on nervous tissue tends to cause the nervous tissue to malfunction. So that's a problem of hydrocephalus, an accumulation of fluids uh, in and around the brain. Meningitis. Uh, meningitis refers to an inflammation of the meninges, and very often this is caused by a bacteria or virus that somehow got into the meninges. 
uh, particularly dangerous if it gets inside subarachnoid space in the cerebral spinal fluid and then can move easily uh, throughout the central nervous system. Uh, as far as cerebral spinal fluid is concerned, uh, here's the general pattern of how it's made. Here's a blood vessel, again located inside your brain in the ventricles of the brain. And there is a place in each one of the ventricles of the brain where a structure called a choroid plexus, right there, a choroid plexus, is able to draw fluids out of the blood, filter it in essence, and separate it, and that becomes cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, we say that cerebral spinal fluid coats, floats, and bloats the central nervous system. And this is where it's gonna bloat it. It's gonna fill up the ventricles of the brain and push those tissues outward towards the cranium, kind of uh, making it fit a little bit better. Uh, so it's gonna move through the ventricles, the four ventricles of the brain. Uh, it's also gonna move out into the subarachnoid space around the brain and spinal cord and eventually back up towards the top of the brain. Some of it will go down into the central canal in the middle of the spinal cord, but it also will eventually get into the subarachnoid space and go up to the top of the brain in the longitudinal fissure where there are structures called arachnoid villi. These arachnoid villi are found inside the dural sinus, like the superior sagittal sinus, and they are going to return the fluid to the blood. So you borrow the fluid over here in the choroid plexes of the ventricles, and you return that fluid over here through the arachnoid villi of the dura sinus, uh, superior sagittal sinus. The amount of cerebral spinal fluid created per day is approximately half a liter. Half a liter created, half a liter returned. Of course, if it isn't returned, there's a possibility of a condition like hydrocephalus. Uh, real quickly here, here are the ventricles of the brain. There are two lateral ventricles to the brain, uh, one in each one of the cerebral hemispheres. Each one kind of looks like a wishbone. They're separated in the middle right here by something called the septum pellucidum. So those are the first and second or lateral ventricles located inside the cerebral hemispheres. They are connected to the third ventricle. The third ventricle is found inside the diencephalon. Uh, basically between the two lobes of the thalamus. And the two lobes of the thalamus have a bridge between them, which makes this little circle right here, which looks like the eye of maybe a bird's head right there. Here are the uh, foramen that are coming from the lateral ventricles, going into the third ventricle. And down here is the cerebral aqueduct, which takes fluid from the third ventricle down into the fourth ventricle. Again, sort of like an antenna to this strange chicken head, and here's a scrawny neck to that strange chicken head. Over here is what's found just below the third ventricle. It's the fourth ventricle. Here's the cerebral aqueduct. It comes down right here. It can connect to the subarachnoid space. It can also connect to the central canal of the spinal cord. And again, this is found in the area of the pons, and it's between the pons and the cerebellum. So in really bad form right here, what you have is two things that look like wishbones in each cerebral hemisphere, connected to something that looks like a bizarre chicken head with an eye on it, connected by a scrawny little neck to this scrawny little kite-like or chicken-like body that is the fourth ventricle between the cerebellum and the pons right there. Oh, one last thing. When it comes around to the materials that are in and around the nervous tissue of the central nervous system, we've already mentioned that there's something called the blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier makes it difficult for anything to leave the blood directly and get into the interstitial spaces in and around the neurons of the central nervous system. The blood-brain barrier is created by astrocytes. The astrocytes send out a process, and at the end of the process, they have something called a perivascular foot. Well, these perivascular feet land on top of the capillary with its simple squamous epithelium and tight junctions, and it puts a second outer layer to the capillaries. Therefore, things moving through the blood cannot easily move into the central nervous system interstitial fluid space. It's up to things such as the astrocytes to control the flow of materials from the blood
into this space right here.